Nine now for a go for auto sequence start. T minus 33. What has happened is the ground launch sequencer would not hand off to the orbiter's computers to complete the count because the liquid oxygen fill and drain valve was showing off when it should be on. T minus 10, go for main engine start. We are go for main engine start. T minus 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Dr. Catherine Sullivan, you've written a book about the Hubble, and we're going to talk a lot about it today. But watching that video all these years later, what, what's it like for you, knowing you were on board? You know, it was one of my, oddly one of my favorite moments because you just saw the skill and professionalism and calm of that exceptional team on full display. And we all sat in the cockpit listening. We had no role in this. It's all the guys you saw on the screen there. But we just sat and listened, not to the commentator, but to the technical communication loops and followed the discussion through. And it was, I mean, it was just a marvel. I had the Launch Control Center actually get me the audio tape of the technical control loops because I wanted to always be able to have that souvenir of these are my guys, this is the team I'm part of. There, you tell this story as your book opens about the 31 cent, uh, second hold. What happened there? So there's a, a set of fuel lines that you fill that big orange uh, tank through. One of them fills the oxygen tank that's within it. And because you want all the propellant to stay in the tank, there's two valves that you close to make sure nothing leaks out. And one of the final checks before the big computer hands over to the shuttle onboard computers is that all those valves are closed. Everything's cool. And the indicator on one of the two valves for the oxygen tank read open. It didn't show the right reading. So, you know, like that could be really bad. Now you're one failure away, the other valve, from propellant leaking out that should be taking you to orbit. Might not get you high enough to deploy Hubble might end up only with enough to get across the Atlantic and land at an emergency runway. In the worst case, you could end up splashed into the Atlantic Ocean. So the engineers needed to stop and look at that and determine, is it really, is the second valve really not closed, or is it just got a flaky indicator? Uh, and that's what we heard the engineer talking through. And, you know, and he was, doing, he was doing physics 101 as he was talking it through. It's super cold oxygen. If that valve's really open, the temperatures should be like this in the area around there, and they're not. They're warmer than that, so it can't be true that the valve is really open. So he ran through all of that in his mind and sent a, a repeat command to that valve, and that sort of made the indicator flip to the correct state. And then it, it's then his call to the bosses in the control center to say, are you, are you prepared to go now or not? On you. And he, he was confident about it. He said, we're go, and you've heard the little pickup then, the countdown resumed, and we clicked over to the automatic sequencer, and 31 seconds later left the Earth. What's it like for the astronauts uh, sitting in the seats knowing all those decisions are really out of your control? You, can, you can't say, stop at this point, I, I, I don't want to go. Uh, you know, if, if the commander on board was really dissatisfied with what he or she was hearing, they could, in principle, do that. Uh, but that team of people, of, of engineers in the Launch Control Center, has countless more indicators and readouts in front of them than we have. So they actually have a better picture in front of them. Uh, but yeah, you at the end of the day, you've got to count on the competency and the skill and the composure. You don't just apply to go sit on that console and be that control engineer. It's a multi-year process of demonstrating your skills and learning more and more and you know, backing up somebody else in sort of an apprentice mode. It's a very elaborate and very formal certification process to have the authority to sit there and make that call. And for obvious reasons, the the entire space shuttle program is going to stop or go based on your word. I, I looked up for this conversation with all the years of space programs in several countries. There are still fewer than 600 people who have been in space. So for all of us earthbound humans, what's the experience like? Yeah, it's a very small club. Um, well, launch, at least on something like a space shuttle, is kind of like being embedded in an earthquake. There's a lot of shaking. The back of your chair is being pushed skyward at a pretty impressive uh, rate. For the shuttle, we only got pressed into our seats with three times the force of gravity. Some other rockets expose you to twice that amount. So you're squeezed into your seat. It's loud. You're rattling. 
you've got to break through the atmosphere and get up into the essentially no atmosphere area. That's where you can accelerate. Use all that rocket power. Now start going fast. Because getting into orbit means going 17,500 miles an hour. That's really hard to do in the thick atmosphere near the Earth. Um, so, you know, the liftoff is, of course, this amazing experience embedded in that ball of energy for eight and a half minutes. And then it flips to this other completely magical experience of being able to float anywhere in a room. Uh, of course, we're really familiar with the cockpit of the shuttle from all our training, but it's always like this room here. That is a floor, and that is a ceiling, and you need a table to put something on, and all of those rules change once you get to zero gravity. You can move massive objects with the tip of a finger. Everyone could get a 10 in gymnastics because you can flip and tumble any way you want. Uh, it's just a delight. Was it different than your zero gravity training, actually being there? Uh, the zero gravity training in the airplane that does the parabola, as I always found, completely worthless. It's never really sustained zero gravity. It's it's twice the force of gravity, and then for 20 seconds it's none, and then back and forth. But the training we did for spacewalks, where you put on a, a, a spacesuit, it's a real spacesuit that's just never going to get used in orbit, and you sink yourself in a large tank of water, absolutely neutrally buoyant. If your scuba divers let go of you, you're not going to pop to the surface or sink to the bottom. That really lets you get a feel of how fluidly, how easily you'll be able to move in zero gravity. Work upside down, what you would think is upside down or sideways, and just put your body where you need it to be to access something without without worrying about what is conventionally up and down and left and right. As we heard, that 1990 mission was the launch of the Hubble. You've had a career filled with scientific achievements. Where does the Hubble project fall for you? Uh, it Being part of the Hubble project falls right at the top for me. Uh, it's you know, the most amazing machine I think we've ever put into orbit, certainly the most amazing scientific instrument. It absolutely has transformed how we understand the universe, our universe, our solar system, how stars form. And you know, to, be, to have any little part in something so transformative and something that seeped out so pervasively into the popular imagination, uh, that's, that has always been the pinnacle. If there's one thing you ask me what am I proudest about of my spaceflight career, it's that I was on Team Hubble. Who was the Hubble named for? Edwin P. Hubble, uh, an astronomer um, from Princeton, I believe, if I remember correctly. He was a guy back in the 20s and 30s that figured out the universe must be expanding. And you can figure out how fast it's expanding by looking at the, the red shift of stars. This is the light wave equivalent of what we all experience when a train is coming towards us and goes past us. You hear the of the train whistle. Light will do that as well. If a star is moving towards you, the natural light it emit, emits will be pushed towards blue, higher frequency. If it's moving away, it will shift towards red. So if you could very carefully measure how much towards the red the light is shifted, you could get a, an indicator of how quickly the universe is expanding. They named this telescope after Hubble because being above the atmosphere with long duration ability to see, not blocked by the atmosphere, and with the instruments it had, it was going to be able to make an much, much more precise measurement of that constant and sort of home in more tightly on how the universe is actually functioning. It's been 30 years since that mission took off. Why are you writing a book about it now? Uh, writing a book about it for a couple of reasons. One is the promise that the engineers made when they were designing Hubble was that it would run for 15, and that would have been complete success. It's going to turn 30 next year. Not only that, but it's not the same telescope anymore. The outer skin is the same. The truss structure that holds the two big mirrors is the same. Uh, and the antennas that beam the data back and forth are the same. And virtually everything else on that telescope is different from the pieces that we put up in 1990. That all comes down to the foresight that engineers had, starting in the mid-60s, actually, to think about actually being building a telescope that you could repair and upgrade while it was in orbit. They reasoned, they reasoned like um, they really drew a parallel to a mountaintop observatory. The mirrors will last for hundreds of years. You bring a new instrument up every time the technology changes. Or when your observing campaign is done, someone else can have a turn because the mirror on the mountaintop is a constant. They wanted to go that direction with Hubble. But it was an amazing amount of foresight in the very earliest days of the space program. And then the years that I worked on Hubble before we took it to orbit, the task then was it's a hypothetically maintainable in orbit, but you guys don't actually have the tools yet and the equipment yet. 
you kind of have to equip the shuttle to actually be able to do that. And I don't think you'll be surprised to hear you don't go to Home Depot and look on aisle four for Hubble telescope tools. These kind of all had to be invented or modified from more commonplace tools. What were the biggest engineering challenges that the people who worked on it had to solve? Uh, the the really biggest one, you know, a telescope has to do three things to succeed. It, it has to see clearly, point precisely, and hold really still. So getting the mirror fashioned correctly and shaped correctly, which of course we later learned they didn't quite do, that was a huge demanding technical undertaking. The whole control system that points Hubble and then holds it very still gave them fits for years and years and years. In comparison to those problems, setting an architecture you know, the layout of, of boxes and units on the Hubble, setting that so that you could get at things easily to replace them. If you know if this breaks, I want to be able to reach right in and get it out, not have to take four other things out. That architecture was set very early on in the design history. And then the, the challenge in 1985 to 1990 was to go look at all those boxes and actually be sure that astronauts really did have tools that could do those jobs, that you know, could reach that fastener, could open that latch, you know, could do the repair or the replacement of all the different boxes. So uh, how important was it that the European Space Agency was involved in this project? Uh, I think politically and budgetarily it was very good and important to have the European Space Agency involved. It, it took something on the order of 20 percent of the cost. Uh, they shared that, and in return they got a commensurate amount of observing time. So it expanded the uh, scientific community that was using Hubble beyond the United States. Uh, but I, probably the reality is it was kind of a go-no-go -go thing with the Congress. We're not going to do this all by ourselves. If this is really a compelling enough scientific endeavor, surely some other partner countries will join in. NASA, go get some other people to join in. Was there competition? For who was, would, was Russia wanting to build a competitor uh, telescope at the time, for example? Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, the start of all this story, uh, really up until the time and beyond the time that we put it into orbit, was still the Cold War era. So I think certainly at my level of a Mark I standard astronaut, my degree of being privy to what the Russians were planning was pretty low. Uh, but you never caught anything in the trade press about Russia planning to build a big telescope. The diplomatic relationships at that time, I think, would have probably prohibited uh, a direct partnership with them. So uh, well, how, um, if you could explain, because you want to tell the story of the important people, but what was the role of NASA in this project and what was the role of private industry? So the role of NASA was to sort of talk to the scientific community, the astronomical community, determine what the science objectives should be, and do some of the first order calculations about what kind of telescope would it take to deliver that science program. Uh, and then the role of industry was design and build that. One of the things that really surprised me as I did my research for the book, I started asking myself, when NASA put the, the bid out to private industry, we're, we've got permission to do this telescope, one of you guys is going to build it. Tell me how you would build it and show me the mathematics that will convince me it would do the things I needed to do. I started to wonder, well, what did NASA say to those companies about maintenance at that time? That would have been 76, 77, 78. Did they have a whole list of we know how we want to do it and things you'll need to provide? And I actually found some of the bid documents in the archives at the Air and Space Museum. And it boiled down to NASA said, it shall be maintainable. You guys figure out. You tell me how you will do that. I'm not giving you a whole lot of prescriptions about it. Probably because they didn't know? Nobody knew. Break. I mean, you think where that was in time, the Skylab missions had only just happened. Those were really, arguably, the first really complicated spacewalks that anyone had done. Jury rigging a repair to the damaged Skylab space station was clearly the most complex thing in the longest time. So no one had a base of experience in spacewalking to draw on. And the engineers that were designing Hubble all the way through, they were motorcycle guys, they were car guys, mm -hmm. they were train guys. So, so they were taking that kind of practical experience from very ground-based enterprises and good engineering principles and their imagination and applying that to this telescope. What a company won the largest portion of the contract? Uh, Lockheed Martin, Lockheed Missiles and Space Corporation, was the prime contractor and the integrator. Based where? Based in Sunnyvale, California. And they had a subcontract with a company called Perkin Elmer to make the big mirror and with other uh, universities uh, and consortia to do the scientific instruments. And, you know, gyros came from another company. So it was a, quite a cascade of subcontracts to get all the pieces together. But setting the architecture was Lockheed's responsibility, uh, verifying that their maintenance philosophy would work 
you know, starting with rough choreography and getting more and more refined as time went forward. That was really all led by Lockheed working with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Since uh, you do want to give credit to some of the players, who are some of the most important people that the rest of the public should know about in this? Uh, you know, I think anyone who worked close on Hubble would tell you that the primary name is Ron Sheffield. He was uh, in a second career. He just finished an illustrious 30-year Army career, was hired into Lockheed and plunked onto the Hubble program like day one. Uh, and he and a small team stayed with Hubble and the repair missions all the way through to the final repair mission. They're, they're the unifying thread. They were the continuity. They were the memory. Uh, they had all the detailed data of every tool and every fastener and every everything. Um, once Hubble got into orbit, the NASA responsibility for planning the servicing missions shifted to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And a key figure there is a guy named Frank Seppolina, who's widely uh, nicknamed the father of satellite servicing. Um, and I know and adore and respect Seppi tremendously, but I could kind of argue that Sheffield is more the father of satellite servicing because he actually designed and built it all. Um, so Ron Sheffield, certainly his two key lieutenants were Peter Leung uh, and Brian Woodford. And then we had a couple of really spectacular tool designers in Houston, uh, Michael Withy and uh, Robert Trevino. And then the folks that would talk with us on console as the our engineering interface for spacewalks, Sue Rainwater and Jim Thornton. Uh, but all those people I named after Ron Sheffield, they would all say, no, no, Sheffield deserves the credit. Does someone know the exact number of, or close to the number of people that were involved completely in the Hubble project and how much the entire thing cost? Oh, dear. What are um, the estimates for this effort? Well, the, the cost estimates, if I recall, were in the th three to four billion range. Don't, just to build it or for the whole project? Oh, yeah, just to build and launch it. And then what was each servicing mission over uh, the ensuing years to 2009? I don't know those numbers. Um, a very safe estimate for the number of people is thousands. But you would argue the American public got their money's worth for this. I absolutely, I think mankind got their money's worth and the American public more than got their money's worth. The inspiration, I, it's, uh, everywhere you go in schools, Hubble images are everywhere. They I mean, we all have the stars over our head and the moon overhead. It's a, we're all fascinated by it in different ways. And to have this super crazy, clear, magical looking glass to show us more what they're really like, it just seems to entrance everybody. Your book um, for the layperson also gives a real sense of the engineering and the science involved in this. One one story that uh, immediately pops to mind thinking about reading it, it was the um, the clean room and, yeah. and the enormity of the clean room. Can you talk about the importance of of not even a particle of dust going into that room? Oh, that, yeah, that was really crazy. Um, Lockheed was at that time building lots of satellites for uh, the Defense Department and intelligence world, and I think this big facility was probably built for them. But it was perfect for Hubble. Uh, Hubble's mirror, the technical term is Hubble's mirror was supposed to be refraction limited, which means it's going to operate right at the limit of the optics and the physics given its size. And even a tiny little bit of dust would start lowering the amount of signal you could get in. It wanted to look at very distant, very dim stars, so you don't want any little bit of film at all on this gigantic mirror. So this room that it was assembled in, the side wall of the room was basically a basketball court stood on end. And the whole wall was an array of huge, large fans that pulled air from the outside and pushed the air through very high precision, I mean, better than hospital filters, better than operating room filters. And they pushed it through with enough velocity that if any little bit of dust got past the filters, it would stay suspended the whole 120-foot length of the building before it could possibly fall. You would happily have cooked your meals on the floor. Um, yeah, everything came into the building downstream of Hubble. So if, we're gonna, if I'm going to come in and maybe have a little bit of dust on me, you come in downstream of the Hubble so all that dust will go the other direction. You consciously limited how many people ever went between the telescope and the filters to not have clothing fibers or dust that we might be transporting get into there. Um, and as I describe in the book, the process of getting kitted up to be able to go into that room had a very strong resemblance to getting ready for a spacewalk. The space shuttle and Hubble go hand in hand with one another. President Nixon approved the shuttle in 1972. How right. long before the first shuttle flew after that? Uh, the first shuttle flight was 1981. 
So nine years. And obviously the, the Hubble approval came in 78, six years later. So yeah. were they envisioned together or did they but develop? They were very much envisioned together and they became sort of mutually dependent politically. Uh, Hubble was one of the big uh, offerings to the science community. This, this new truck that NASA is building is not just going to haul satellites back and forth for commercial industry. It's going to do remarkable things for the science community as well, like take an instrument the scale of Hubble up to orbit and then keep it repaired and operating and at the cutting edge of technology because we can replace things as the technology ages. Um, the shuttle was approved, as you said, in 1972 by President Nixon. Congress's first approval to actually start more detailed design on this idea of a telescope, that came in 1973. So from 73 to 78, the shuttle design is getting more and more refined because it was still very much on the drawing boards when Hubble got its first okay. So, you know, we think the payload bay is going to be this big. We think it can carry this much. We think the telescope's going to look like this. Those went back and forth through that five-year uh, interval of 73 to 78, getting more and more attuned to each other and tailored to working together. When did the shuttle program end? Uh, what was that, 2011? And Th why did 2013. it end? 2013. Um, NASA had been getting pressured for quite some time to not stay stuck in low Earth orbit, go back to its kind of its original mandate to break open the new frontiers. Uh, and they'd been working for an, a number of years on the design of a new launch system, uh, a new spacecraft that could go beyond low Earth orbit, off to at least the moon, maybe to Mars. And as with Hubble, you can do some of that design work basically on paper for quite some time and get the math and the engineering all refined. But at some point, you need to actually start building pieces and prototypes and confirm that the design is going to work like you think on paper. That costs more money. And so it was um, both a White House and a congressional political decision that NASA would not be given an increase in budget to accommodate that uh, prototyping. They would have to take it from something else. Um, and the decision was, well, let's retire the shuttle. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and several private sector companies were, even then, saying, we think we're getting close to the point where we could be the airline that takes your people back and forth to low Earth orbit. So stop running a shuttle of your own and get ready to hire us. Buy seats from us. We'll take your astronauts back and forth. That's also taken longer than the forecasts were back when it started, but that was part of the argument. As someone who uh, spent a lot of your career in the space program, how do you feel about the privatization of, of space travel? Well, I mean, I don't have any big philosophical objections to it. In my tenure at NASA, a lot of the work that NASA was um, championing and getting approval to do was being done by private sector contractors, very competent people, very responsible people, um, fine companies operating very well. We sort of didn't care too much which badge you had, a NASA badge or a contractor badge. Um, so I'm fine with that. Uh, I think any of these companies that are going to try to operate shuttle services back and forth to low Earth orbit, either for cargo or for people, I, th I think they're finding they will be held to a very similar safety standard as NASA. They might find more efficient ways to meet that standard. Uh, but you know, get things you take to space, even equipment you take to space, is intrinsically expensive. Insurance companies are not going to be very happy with you losing two or three of them in a row. And obviously, the American public would uh, put a pretty quick halt to things. I think if you were getting cavalier with the lives of, of private astronauts, tourists, or American astronauts. So this book also tells something of your story. Uh, you come into the picture in 1951. Uh, where, where were you born? And you describe yourself as a Sputnik baby. So uh, for the younger folks up there, <laughs> yeah. what's that mean? Uh, I was born in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, the northeast corner of New Jersey. My father was a young aerospace engineer in his first big job after his master's degree. Um, and of course, in 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. I think even in those first six years or so, because my dad was so into aerospace, we kind of had as little kids, an attunement to that. He would come home all excited about new things that were going on and share pictures from magazines with us. But I have a pretty clear memory of him hustling us out into the front yard of our little apartment in October 57. It would have been the day after my sixth birthday. And pointing up at this little light moving across the sky. Um, I think I was excited about it because Dad was excited about it. I probably didn't really understand what it was. Certainly didn't understand the big geopolitical implications of it. Um, but pretty soon after that, we moved out to Southern California, where the epicenter of aerospace was really starting to take anchor, and lived there through my high school and college years, right in the middle of all of the space stuff. How many kids were in your family? Just me and an older brother. 
older brother Grant. And he will have a role that we'll talk about in yeah. just a minute. Um, so the, your career in science was not a given because you write that you actually had a gift in another direction, languages. Yeah, I sort of bounced back and forth. In second grade, I was the odd little girl that when, I, when we had a chance to take any book we wanted from the school library, I took one about rocket propulsion. And I discovered there is this thing called the equ equation for escape velocity. I was amazed that anybody could know how fast you need to go to get all the way away from Earth. It was stunning. And in fifth grade, a family friend helped me recognize the talent I have for foreign languages. Uh, I, I think, honestly, since my real motivation was somebody needs to buy me airplane tickets so I can travel and live in exotic foreign countries, I decided the theory, best theory of action was learn a lot of languages. Somehow that'll become your key to that life of adventure and travel. How many do you speak? Um, French and Norwegian are as comfortable as English. Why Norwegian? Uh, I did my third year of university in Norway, and Norwegian's so close to Swedish and Danish that I can converse or read in those languages. And I was you know, quite fluent in German at the, by the end of my first year of college, but it's the rustiest of them all. Where did you go to college? University of California at Santa Cruz. And fighting banana slugs. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> it is. <yeah. laughs> fighting banana slugs. And, and uh, what was your major? Well, I started as a language and linguistics major and uh, was informed when I arrived on campus that language majors like me had to take three natural science courses uh, in our first freshman year. Uh, I thought it was a terrible idea and argued and fought. And looking back now, I'm glad I lost all the arguments. Uh, so I ended up, two of the classes were marine science and geology courses, and that's where I saw a different way to think about this life of adventure that I was interested in, because the two key professors were not a whole lot older than me. They were young faculty, very dynamic, passionate about their subjects, taking us up into the mountains or out to the shoreline every weekend, doing this sort of, let's see how this works, what's over there, and it was just, these guys are amazing. They're having so much fun. And my French professor sitting in his office with clipped out text from some Rousseau work on his wall so he can annotate and mark it. I thought, I can have a quiet office with a dog. I can go with these guys out into the field. And they were always traveling off somewhere to join a ship or do some other field work. And I thought, I'm going with these guys. And the liberal arts people that are listening are going to be disappointed <laughs> by this story. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I wondered for about a year. I sort of bashed my head a bit about what sort of a waste that you didn't go this way senior year of high school and... So all the lost time kind of thing. But the literature and the language work that I did through high school and that really I have continued since absolutely pays huge dividends. It's, it gave me my communication skill. It gave me cultural empathy. It gave me a fluency to move uh, around large parts of the world that has been hugely valuable personally and professionally. So it, you know, it, it really wasn't either or for me. It's been both of them welded together. So thus inspired, what did you do after college graduation? Um, well, with that exchange year in Norway, I had gotten a glimpse of the geology of the North Atlantic, which was just being transformed into plate tectonics at that time. And one of the really active, vibrant research groups that was doing that was based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Canada. And so I ended up at grad school at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia and working with the Bedford Institute of Oceanography and ended up owning a little piece of the Atlantic Ocean seafloor that no one had ever mapped before. And got to map it myself and name the features on it. And it was great fun. We actually have a video from your graduation from your PhD oh, program. <laughs> the wonders of the internet, right? Yeah. Let's, let's watch. Catherine Dreyer Sullivan, by the authority vested in me by the Senate of Dalhousie University, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Philosophy with all the rights and privileges there to retain it. And I congratulate you. Dr. Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan leaves us to go to NASA, the U.S. Space Agency, to be one of the first women to enter the training course as an astronaut. And we wish you good luck. And the, the two really delightful things about the way Dalhousie did those ceremonies, you know, your president has just hooded you and shaken your hands and basically says, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kathy, it's the first time anyone called you doctor and your family is there. And then you go sit with the faculty on stage instead of going back into the audience because you now are a credentialed member of the academy. And that was kind of, well, this is interesting. 
But here you are getting your PhD in oceans, correct? Right. And you were off to NASA. So this is where your brother comes back into the story. What was his role in that? So about a year, a little more than a year before that, at uh, the Christmas time of 1976, I guess it would have been, he had been tracking all the advertisements NASA had out to recruit for the shuttle program. He's the flying nut in the family from this tall. And he'd already applied both for the job I ended up with and to pilot the space shuttle. And he was lobbying me during that Christmas holiday that I should apply too. Um, you know you know how to run expeditions from small airplanes to small boats to the research ships. They're looking for women. You know, how many 26-year-old female PhDs can there be in the world? Uh, and in the course of the Christmas vacation, I just dismissed him out of hand. The area I was working in, in the Atlantic, was about 13,000 feet of water. It's hard enough to do geology through 13,000 feet of water. And the notion of going 200 miles further away just struck me as ridiculous. But when I got back to Halifax after the holiday, I saw one of NASA's advertisements in a trade publication. And that's where a, a different perspective clicked in. I said, they're actually looking for people that can run expeditions. They're building a research ship. And I, of all the things I liked about my oceanography work, what I liked best was the operational aspect of planning and running expeditions at sea. And, you know, you make a plan, you know what you're trying to do, you know what the science objectives are. Nothing ever goes quite the way you planned. The weather hits you or something fails, and you're always improvising and adapting to still get it done despite whatever banana peels get thrown at your feet. Um, I loved the challenge. I loved being at sea. Uh, I was good at it. I thought, well, if they're looking for expedition managers, I think I'm one of them. How many people applied in your class? Oh, it was something north of 8,700, 8, mm -hmm. closer to 9,000 people. How many were selected? 35. And what uh, that uh, every class I've read has a nickname. What was yours? Yeah, we were probably the least creative class to come <laughs> along in a very long time. There were 35 of us, and we spent probably a month trying to come up with clever thir somethings on 35s. There's a military acronym, TFNG, that in a squadron, when someone new has reported aboard, that person's called the, the TFNG, the effing mm -hmm. new guy. So we thought, well, we're TFNG too, but we're the 35 new guys. The folks that have been there before us probably are still not entirely happy having 35 newbies show up. So we just became the, the TFNGs. But you weren't new guys. Well, I think most of us were quite happy just, you know, using, letting, well, letting that term be used. It was, a, it was the class was not all men at right. this point. But so. I think we kind of, at least the six of us at that time, we sort of didn't care. And, and who, what was the makeup of the class? Um, so 15 of the class were sort of military test pilots of the sort NASA had hired uh, many times in the past, except that one of them was African-American. And then 20 were this new category called mission specialists, scientists, MDs, engineers. I think we were about a third with from military back, something like a third from military backgrounds and two-thirds from civilian backgrounds. And that's where we had the six women, two other African-Americans, and an Asian-American. What year was this? This was 1978 when we finally joined NASA. And how much training do you have before you actually get a space mission? Uh, well, we were in line behind all the astronauts who'd been waiting around since Apollo. Um, and the shuttle, when we joined in 1978, the shuttle supposedly was going to be flying its first test flights by you know, within a year, year and a half. That turned out to take longer, more like three years to get to. So we did, a, as every class does, a one-year condensed crash graduate school for astronauts. It's basically what it is. Think of every element of science and engineering that might have anything to do with spaceflight, and you're going to get a, a crash course in it from national experts. They're basically like a first-year grad school course crammed into six or eight weeks. Uh, and everyone goes through it together, so the PhD astronomer sits through Astronomy 101 with me, I sit through Oceanography 101, and so on with the engineering. Uh, and at that point, you're sort of blessed as welcome to the astronaut corps uh, and entitled to wear the astronaut corps symbol. And then you start getting plugged into support roles in flights that are coming up. So you kind of you learn how a shuttle mission or a space mission comes together by doing some of the background work and seeing from within how all the pieces and parts of a mission have to be planned and integrated, connected together, make sure they work together. I, I liken it to starting out in a big corporation down in the mailroom where you can see how all the pieces interact. And if you move up to a more senior position, that knowledge of, of how the system underneath you behaves will be really helpful. If you had to describe the qualities that it takes to be a successful astronaut, what are they? Um, goal or purpose-oriented. Uh, um, 
persistent, self-disciplined. You've got to be a self-starter. Um, love learning. Close to insatiable curiosity. Did everybody that was selected make it through the program? They did. NASA, NASA selects to fly. They're not, you know, the military often they'll select 100 people to go through pilot training knowing or planning that they're going to wash out a third or a half. NASA went the other way. More, more care and more uh, precision and, and diligence in the selection so that everyone's going to fly. From the 1978 class, it was Sally Ride, one of your colleagues, who was chosen mm -hmm. to be the first woman in space. Uh, you write about that selection process and how ultimately you were happy that it wasn't you. Yeah, yeah, I was. I mean, we're all pretty competitive. And I think uh, I think we all knew, believed that if, if we got the nod to go first, we could do a fine job. I still think that was true about all six of us. Um, Sally was certainly a fine choice in countless ways. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of, you know, we're all used to finishing first in our class, getting A's and winning anything we go after, and suddenly it's not going to happen. So you got to get over that little disappointment moment. Uh, but when uh, she landed, when their flight landed, uh, weather forced them to land in California at Edwards Air Force Base instead of in Florida. NASA had assembled a massive crowd of very VIP people uh, in Florida to watch the landing and to be the first people to meet this, the crew and this now very famous woman, um, Jane Fond. I mean, all sorts of names the White House had invited and NASA had invited, Sally had invited. And when it became clear they were going to end up in California, I got tapped along with one other astronaut to fly down to the Cape and basically stand in for the crew and you know, entertain the VIPs and help them get through the disappointment of not getting to meet them all so quickly. Um, you know, I was less than really thrilled about that. I was sort of, wait a minute. Uh, but yeah, when we walked into that hallway, a big, massive auditorium, uh, two thoughts went through my mind right away. One was... I'm really glad Sally's not here, because if she they had landed in Florida, she would have had maybe an hour and a half from landing to get showered and changed and checked by the docks, and then you know be catapulted into that room to make nice with all the hundreds of people that were there. And I could appreciate how you'd rather have some quiet time after such an amazing experience, some bit of a quiet time with just your crew to savor it a little bit before you have to go on and you know, be a public presence for everyone. And my immediate second thought was, if this is what you get for going first, she can have it. But you got your own first shortly yeah. thereafter. And we've got some video, once again. Uh -huh. This is from October 11th, 1984. Yes, We're going to watch, and this, this would be, as we watch, it would be helpful if you help narrate it a sure. bit for us. So, so this would be on the upper deck of the space shuttle. Not quite sure what I'm organizing there, Sally. And I think that's Bob Crippen. John McBride's the guy on the right, and he's helping hook up the cooling garment. The white thing I'm wearing is like long johns, but it's got tubes, thin tubes of cold water in it. Uh, Dave Leesma with the red stripe is already out in the payload bay collecting his tools. That's me slipping out from the airlock. You know, we call it a spacewalk. That's actually the wrong verb. You can see it's more like swimming uh, than it is like uh, walking. Uh, and our job was really pretty simple. We moved all the way to the back of the cargo bay to work on an experiment. This antenna that you see here, Dave on the left, me on the right, um, it had broken, so my final job was to move along the path you see me on here and get near that antenna so I could put it into the position that it needed to get to, to so we could bring it home safely. And with that, you became the first American woman to walk in space. I did. And so uh, what is that, that honor like? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not anything that really drove why I was there or how I prepared for it. I, you know, my first spacewalk was going to be my first spacewalk, no matter how many people had gone before me, men or women. And if you want to ever get assigned to do a second spacewalk, you really want to do the first one very well. Uh, but I, you know, I appreciate the opportunities it's given me, in particular, to inspire younger people, um, encourage them to you know, reach for the stars, to set a big goal and, and work for it. So opening those doors, opening hearts and minds of younger people, that to me is the real privilege that comes with the with the honor. I wrote down a sentence from that chapter. I was keenly aware that the environment out my, outside my suit was deadly, yet felt utterly comfortable. Yeah, I mean, you'd spent, you've spent so much time in a spacesuit by that point, mostly in the water tanks, training to, for moving around. But you've also been in your own actual flight-qualified suit in a chamber where they pump all the air out. So you've, you've had that experience of, I'm okay here, and there's, actually there's no air in this room anymore. I was always bemused. The room looks the same, with and without air in it. And you have to kind of remember, if you open the visor right now, the, 
it doesn't work. You're going to be quickly unconscious and dead. What, what is the greatest risk? A, a puncture in the suit is the greatest risk. Um, there's an, emer an emergency oxygen supply that can overcome punctures of a certain size. But a, a really big puncture or something that shatters and cracks the visor, uh, that would be the biggest risk. After this first, uh, how did your life change? Well, you know, I had not ever expected to talk directly to a president of the United States before, and, and within a couple hours of coming back in the hatch, we were on the air-to-ground loop with President Reagan, and a couple months later, I was seated right next to him at a state dinner at the White House, which a little girl from suburban Southern California, was not, this is not where I thought I would end up. Um, but, you know, the main thing for me was that I was pretty quickly after that put back in the flight rotation and assigned to another flight. So I wasn't going to have to cool my heels on the ground for too very long. And it was the Hubble flight, which was, you know, it was really a, a standout cargo. And in all the cargoes and flights that were listed out down through the calendar, that was really a, no pun intended, that was a real stellar standout. Wouldn't it be cool to be on this mission? You're going to go way high, and you're going to be part of putting this amazing thing into orbit. But six years between that 1984 spacewalk and the, the first video we saw of your launch, why did it take six years? The main reason it took six years was because of the Challenger accident. Uh, Hubble, when I was assigned to it, was slated to fly in October of 1986. Uh, and in fact, the, the day the Challenger exploded, I was flying back from doing some work in Sunnyvale on the telescope. So we were, we were actually kind of on a forced march. It was a really tight timeline to get all the tools and equipment prepared and tested that we needed for the flight. Um, Challenger explodes. The whole fleet is grounded. Uh, it takes a very long time. It takes many months to dig into all the engineering and find out what, what's the root cause, why did that happen. And then, of course, everyone steps back and says, where else might we have missed a hazard of similar magnitude? So you really you're really turning everything upside down and checking and rechecking all the engineering, all of the assumptions, all of the, the risk calculations. To get through all of that, then you end up with a list of things that are got to fixes before you can go fly again. So all of that combined took, um, well, it, it took three and a half years before the shuttle flew again in 1988. But once it started flying again, there were cargoes that had higher priority to get into orbit quickly, and Hubble was just kind of flexible. It, it could go whenever. It wasn't trying to get to Mars and have to hit a launch window. It wasn't a high-value communication satellite. So we just kept slipping further and further to the right uh, in the sequence of payloads. By coincidence, we're actually taping this on the shuttle, uh, the uh, shuttle, shuttle Challenger tragic accident day, the anniversary day. Yes. Uh, was there some thought that, that the, the, sh the whole shuttle program would be s stopped as a result of that? You know, I don't know how real or widespread that thought was in the key decision-making circles, uh, but I certainly felt worried about it. I mean, the, the anguish and the hue and cry uh, about the loss of the shuttle and the crew, um, you know, it just, it became a worry of mine that if if we're going to stop this whole program because we lost one vehicle and one crew, I had given a lot of thought to the risk and reward equation for the country, for mankind, for me, before I even filled out the application. And if we were now going to knock it all off and quit because one TV episode turned out badly, or then I was clearly fooled. I thought we were doing this for really worthwhile purposes, uh, worthwhile to the country, worthwhile to mankind. And if you guys were just doing it because it's good television and nice entertainment until you have an unhappy day and then you'll stop, then I miscalculated what we were really about here. I thought we were about something really deeply meaningful to the country, to the future. Um, and so I fretted about that quietly, but I was really, you know, we're going to go fly again or I'm going to be really mad. And, and in fact, you did. Yeah. Uh, who was Bruce McCandless and why was he important to the Hubble launch project? Bruce McCandless is one of the... the really most interesting, unique astronauts I think the program maybe has ever had. Uh, super bright guy, uh, graduated second in his class from Annapolis, the son and grandson of Medal of Honor recipients, naval officer. Uh, and he came to the astronaut corps in the, in the um, early 70s with the, what became called the XS-11 group. When we came along, he's this incredibly talented, very intense design engineer. You've all seen Bruce McCandless. If you've seen the picture of an astronaut hanging off all by himself against the backdrop of space, little white spacesuit with red stripes, that's Bruce. And the little rocket pack that he used to fly that far away from the shuttle, he co-designed. 
with some folks at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, he had done some of the early, pr very early preliminary work on Hubble back in the mid-70s, roughing out how spacewalks would work. And he was uh, my co-spacewalker for the Hubble deployment flight. So we were the two, both experienced, both flown, done spacewalks. We were the two that, if, if anything didn't go right on the day that we were deploying Hubble, if everything didn't unfold properly and so on, we would hop in our spacesuits and go out and fix it. So that mission that we saw at the beginning was five days in length. What was the most critical part of that mission? Uh, uh, you know, other than successfully getting to orbit, the most critical part was the next day when we were deploying Hubble. And this is, you know, it's a school bus sized piece of equipment. It fits like with inches to spare in the shuttle cargo bay. Steve Hawley's job was grab it with the shuttle's 50-foot-long robotic arm and very carefully lift it up out of the payload bay, don't bump it on anything, and then poise it above the cargo bay so the Hubble team on the ground could send up all the computer commands that would unfold solar arrays and unfold antennas and power up all the electronics. And things started you know, taking too long and going not well pretty soon in that sequence. Uh, why we were spring-loaded is... Hubble had been riding on the shuttle's electrical power until we started all of that deployment. We pulled the plug when Steve began lifting it up. So now you're relying on the onboard batteries, and they could only run for so long. So everything needed to be unfolded and in the right place, solar arrays producing electricity by a certain time, not many hours away, or you could lose Hubble before you even got started. So that's why Bruce and I were, we actually went halfway through the spacewalk preparations before Steve started lifting the telescope, so that if something went wrong, it would only take us about two hours to get outside. And when did you have, in that five days, it worked, we can go home, it's a success? Yeah, we dropped it off that day, finally, it all happened, and we backed away 20 or 30 miles and did station keeping while they, the ground crew did some more checkout. If something else had popped up to be wrong, we could have flown back in and grabbed it and tried to repair but it was around the fourth day that Mission Control came up and said, everything's checking out okay, you guys can now start preparations to come home. How long did it take before the world knew that Hubble's telescope didn't work the way it was intended? Yeah, we put it into orbit in April, and I think it was something around, it was, it was months, because the period of time you just let the telescope equilibrate with being in orbit, and then you start checking and testing everything. And the key thing was, move the, the secondary mirror, the small mirror, back and forth to get it into focus. And it wouldn't focus. And of course, everybody's first idea was, well, we're doing something wrong. Of course it's going to focus. Try this all again. And it, it just took a, you know, six-ish kind of weeks, I think, for the data to accumulate enough that people could not escape, the scientists could not escape the conclusion that the reason it won't focus is because the big mirror is wrong. What a hit to NASA's reputation. Oh, it was, yeah, it was devastating. You could see it, the, the first briefing of the science team and the headquarters team that had to come before the press and basically announce and confess this big expensive thing, blah, blah, blah. It can't see straight. It's got blurry vision. They were, they were ashen-faced. Um, the media erupted. The Congress erupted. There was a really painful year or so where Hubble was the butt of every joke about incompetence on late-night TV shows and... Um, one of the Naked Gun movies. It was just painful. It ha is a story, of course, everybody watching this knows that has a happy ending. Uh, we have a video from three years later, 1993, and this is from our world, Senator Barbara Mikulski, former Maryland senator, uh, at a, a press conference with NASA officials talking about the, the fix. Let's watch. I chair the subcommittee that financed uh, the manufacture of the most significant contact lens in American history, <laughs> the uh, fix on the Hubble Space Telescope, and then bankrolled uh, this extraordinary space HMO uh, that went out and gave Hel Hubble Telescope a new uh, contact lens. And I'm happy to announce today that after its launch now in 1990, some of its earlier disappointments, the trouble with Hubble is over. <laughs> Senator McCulsey was always a huge champion of NASA, which didn't mean she was always kindly. I mean, she had high expectations and, you know, pushed them ferociously. But she believed in the agency, and I think, you know, as she said, she, she was persuaded. She came to the rescue. 
The Hubble upgrade missions, the It Shall Be Maintainable, the statistics, five maintenance missions, 16 spacewalkers, 165 point hours of repair work, and over that time, threefold increase in sensitivity. What should we take away from those stats? Uh, the thinking ahead about making this amazing machine maintainable uh, has paid extraordinary dividends. The hard work to get it there has paid huge dividends. The maintainability is why it was possible to put the contact lens into Hubble and fix it in the first place. But you know, I guesstimate, and I'm only a geologist, so it's just a guesstimate, but I'd guesstimate Hubble today is about a thousand times better than the telescope we put into orbit in 1990. Every instrument, when it went up, put the new prescription in it and new detectors of higher sensitivity and higher resolution. Um, the solar rays got smaller but produced more power. The batteries got smaller but produced store more power. All of the uh, mechanical equipment that is prone to breaking and failing, like olden day tape recorders, became solid state. The computers went from something like an old 286 machine that no one can even remember anymore to much closer to state of the art. So scientific power, accuracy, sensitivity, reliability, all of that just evolved continually through the servicing missions. And its lifespan is estimated to be how long now? We're at the 30-year mark, and so, is it going to keep on going for a while? We're at the 30-year mark, which is twice the lifespan that was promised back at the design phase. Um, and it's going, it's going well. It's got no major defects with it at the moment. You know, it will go until one of three things happen, I would say. Probably, you know, gyros start to fail, so it can't point and hold as still as it needs to do. Um, you know, a micrometeorite or something hits it and creates some other kind of damage, because without the shuttle, it's no longer possible to repair the telescope. Or, uh, you know, its successor, its designated successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, gets out to its designated orbit sometime in 2021, and at some point, NASA and, and or the Congress might say, why am I paying to run two telescopes at once? The Hubble community's had a fantastic 30-year run, twice as long as we promised you. Time to send you guys home and, and just support the James Webb. And does the, uh, will the hulk of the Hubble stay in orbit, or what happens to it? Uh, the last servicing mission attached a fixture to the very back of Hubble that um, a cargo craft, a robotic cargo craft, could fly up and grab that and use its onboard motors to slow Hubble down so that it would land at a predictable point in the ocean. So you know, that possibility is now feasible. It wouldn't have been before. Whether that would, in fact, be what NASA would choose to do, I think, remains to be seen. Do you have a favorite series of Hubble images? I'm a real fan of the galaxy images. Sombrero Galaxy, the Cat's Eye Nebula. Yeah, I've got my, my cell phone's got a whole folder of Hubble <laughs> favorites. So in the largest sense, what have we learned from this project? Uh, we've learned that we have so much more to learn about the universe we live in and how it forms and how it operates. Uh, but we've also learned a ton more about black holes, where they are, what they are, uh, about how galaxies form, how stars form. We've been able to look into stellar nurseries where stars are actually forming. We've been able to look much further back in time because of the, the distant seeing power of Hubble. Um, and that's you know our place in the universe and how this universe works is a big part of what Hubble is unlocking. It, it spotted some of the first exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than our sun, and it's passed that baton on to some of the other uh, astronomical satellites now. It's given, up, given us very close-up looks at other planets in our solar system. It let us watch a comet hit the atmosphere of Jupiter and teach us so much more about how the gaseous planets in our solar system work. The title of your book is Handprints on Hubble. What does that come from? Well, I've uh, said long for many years that although my name is actually not one of the most commonly associated names with Hubble, the names of the spacewalkers that did the repair missions often are more top of mind, but that I made enough contributions to Hubble, I feel like I have, I used, used to say, a fingerprint on every Hubble discovery. Uh, and as I was writing the book, I learned that there actually are real handprints on Hubble, where the spacewalking astronauts that did the repairs touched it, and that John Grunsfeld, who's known colloquially as Dr. Hubble, John took a picture on his last spacewalk of some of those scuff marks, some of those handprints. So I switched fingerprints into handprints, the alliterations a little better, and I used that picture to close the book. The people I wanted to celebrate here, the Ron Sheffields and Michael Withies and Peter Leung's, I think they, like I, have handprints on Hubble, even if our names are not front and center, top in mind, 
when people write about it or talk about it. So there are metaphorical handprints on Hubble by many thousands of people. And then there are the real handprints from those 16 spacewalkers. You left NASA how long after the, the launch of the Hubble? Um, I made another flight in the spring of 1992. And uh, the day we landed was asked to allow my name to go forward to the White House to be nominated as the chief scientist of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and so I moved from Houston up to Washington in something like July of that year. And, got confirmed the following spring and made the rest of my government career largely with NOAA. So it kind of brought you back to oceans it again? Did. Back um, to the planet. If you look across the arc of your, your scientific career, what's been the meaning of it for you? What are you trying to accomplish with your life's work? <clears throat> well, I think what's always driven me has been a curi deep, broad curiosity about the, our planet and its geography in every sense of that word in the broadest possible way. Peoples, cultures, landscapes, how the natural systems work, the atmosphere, the ocean. You know, my deepest motivation for applying to the shuttle program was that if I got in, I would get to see the Earth with my own eyes from orbit. And I just couldn't pass up that possibility. Even if the odds were very remote, you had to give it a try. And so that's kind of always been, how do we understand this planet better and how do we connect our understanding of it to some of the decisions that we make, the way we live on this planet, take care of this planet. If there's a young person watching that, that aspires to a career in space, what would you say to get them started? Uh, go for it. Uh, dream big. Work hard. Uh, don't ever let anyone edit your, the things you're interested in. Go for it. Um, and, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worth it. It's really, really worth it to be part of something that is so much bigger than yourself. So go, reach for your stars. Go for it. Well, thank you for the hour that you spent with C-SPAN as you do your book tour, Dr. Sullivan. It was uh, delightful to go back in history and look at the space program through your eyes. Thank you for the chance to talk about it. Liked it. All Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast at cspan.org.